I proudly present our next speaker. He's done a lot of exciting things, and I will just give you some very brief examples. It's things like running a communica communication company in Iraq and Afghanistan. There are things about building a data haven on a platform in the Atlantic Ocean and the North Sea. So um, I'm very proud to have him here. Please give a warm welcome to Ryan Lecke. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and it's great to be here. Uh, CCC is my favorite conference out of all the conferences I go to. Uh, great crowd. First day, it's already really exciting, so looking forward to it. So I'm going to talk about data havens from Haven Co. to today. Uh, just a quick overview. Uh, who am I? What's a data haven? Uh, where do they come from? Why would you need it? Why have they failed? And then some ways to be successful. I really like this idea of having a conference track on things that have failed, because normally people are ashamed to talk about things that have failed or try to minimize how much things, things that have gone wrong, and it's really the only way to learn. The only way to learn is to make mistakes, and it's better for someone else to make those mistakes rather than you, rather than making them over and over again. So, yeah. <laughs> So just as background, I've been interested in uh, crypto and e-cash specifically, anonymous electronic cash since the early 1990s, uh, the cypherpunks mailing list and a bunch of stuff like that. Uh, I started the offshore data haven Haven Co, which we're going to talk about in 2000 with some friends of mine. I then worked in some war zones doing satellite communications using some of the experience I had from the Haven Co operation. Then I did a trusted computing startup working on trusted cloud computing. And now I work at Cloudflare, which bought my uh, trusted cloud computing company. So first thing is, what is a data haven? Uh, a lot of people use the term, they use it for different things. Uh, we're gonna talk about the Wikipedia definition, which is now, I would say, the canonical way to find the definition of something, a refuge for uninterrupted or unregulated data. So that's really two parts, and there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, uninterrupted, meaning against natural disaster, against normal service interruptions, things like that, but also against active attacks, censorship, uh, things like that. There's a concept, this concept of regulatory arbitrage, where you have one set of laws in one place, another set of laws in another place, and you're trying to pick and, ma and, pick and choose like which pieces of law are the best for you and the best for your operation. And there's all sorts of traits that go into uh, a data haven. There's a physical, legal, operational, cryptographic. Uh, data haven could be both a physical data haven or a uh, software data haven sort of cryptographic approach or some combination a hybrid approach to those things. So the origin, uh, as, as with a lot of things, before someone built one, people have talked about it and thought about what could happen. Uh, fiction, science fiction, is generally a great predictor of science fact, and science fiction has talked about this for a long time. Uh, there's also analogies in some very similar fields that are outside of the data or data processing world that are very similar. And there were some people doing data havens, at least in some sense, before HavenCo. But HavenCo is really the first purpose-built physical data haven uh, that, that I certainly know about. Uh, so in fiction, there's some, some great science fiction. Uh, as we move down this list, they get more and more precise. Early on, it was more about the concept of crypto software things. Then it was sort of passing references to it. I would say Islands in the Net by Bruce Sterling, which is a great book, is probably the first uh, story that really references data havens and multiple data havens and how they interoperate. If you haven't read these, all of these are great books. They're part of like the canon of science fiction, so I would definitely read them. Cryptonomicon has a really interesting history with uh, Havenco. It was started uh, probably 98 or so he started writing it. I didn't find out about it until after we'd already started Havenco, but they were sort of completely parallel evolution and huge numbers of weird parallels, like people's names, a lot of, a lot of factors about it were very, very similar. So I guess it was just the right place at the right time. Um, and then uh, as you move down this list, uh, Damon and Freedom are probably my two favorite uh, sci-fi books. They're, they're very, uh, persistently reference the idea of software that can't be terminated, so it solves this uninterrupted problem. But I would say that now data havens are like a concept that are, that's used in fiction quite, quite frequently. Uh, and then there were some analogies that are outside of the sort of data processing world. Free trade zones in countries, I think UAE is probably the, the biggest exponent of these, are a great analogy where you have a country that has one set of laws, but in a certain geographic area or for a certain set of entities, they're allowed to have different laws. And the idea is that foreign businesses will locate there, take advantage of these favorable laws, and they wouldn't otherwise have been in the country, and it doesn't affect the country. Uh, there's also the concept of offshore banking, the whole like uh, theoretical Swiss bank account where you are a 
political leader in some foreign country and you embezzle a bunch of money from your country and send it off to another country, uh, or you live in a country that's horribly repressive and will take away all your assets and you store them in a place like this. It's really a value neutral kind of thing. The concept of tax havens, I mean, people talk, at least in America, a lot about the way Apple shelters a lot of their income through foreign entities, even though it's earned over, over, overseas, but these have existed for a long time. And then shipping, I think basically all ships uh, of uh, large commercial ships are registered in a small number of jurisdictions that are different from the beneficial owners of that thing. Like Liberia, countries like that have huge numbers of ships but don't really have businesses there for them. And that's just because they have very favorable laws. And then there's gambling centers, like Macau next to Hong Kong and China is not really catering to the local uh, Macau population. It's people flying there to gamble. Uh, so there's that. And then there were some data havens pre-Haven Co. So they're like the late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s. Um, in the Wares community, there was the sort of like top site uh, system, which these were servers that were relatively well protected by usually being run by an admin on the side or something like that. Uh, there was a company, Offshore Information Services Limited, run by Vince Kate, who is uh, one of the top people from the cypherpunks community creating this kind of stuff. He started a business offshore before almost anyone from the U.S. had considered it in this field uh, in Anguilla. He was actually my next door neighbor while I lived there. Uh, he had, a, it was a relatively small business. He had a bunch of like car batteries as a UPS and um, a 10 base 2 connection to me and a T1 connection or 1.5 megabit connection. And he had a couple of really big clients, but this was to some extent one of the first data havens because it hosted data from the US that was under US law, not allowed to be retained for a period of time. It basically, it was a driver's license database from I think the state of Texas where they couldn't retain the documents longer than a year, but there was this other company that would retain them forever and let people search against them. Uh, again, value neutral. Uh, and then there's the whole like dark period of the 90s, which I'm afraid we're going back to, where crypto software was um, banned from export, or at least you couldn't give it to a foreign national. So effectively, you had to do all your crypto development if you wanted it to be open outside of the United States. Um, and we're sort of going back in that direction with the uh, exploits world. Um, but in that case, you had to be outside of the US and a non-US citizen to do a lot of this development. There was a system that Ross Anderson from Cambridge had, uh, Eternity, and then a few people, um, two of whom are on the possibly Satoshi list, uh, created versions of it, and I created a pretty bad version of it. Uh, Tazri Weber, these are all software systems at the end. And then of course, there's the concept of availability from a high-end data center. You've got um, great data centers where people spent uh, 365 main in San Francisco, $2 billion building this data center. The idea being that it'll stay up through any sort of disaster, it's isolated from earthquakes, it's got a bunch of diesel fuel on site. Of course, there's a software bug in all their UPSs, so they all crash at the same time, but yeah, <laughs> minor data. Um, and there's been uses of this. Censorship resistance is the first thing that most people think of when they think of a data haven, they think of data that someone's actually trying to shut down, but part of it is just uncertainty. Like, until very recently, or still ongoing, we don't really know the legal status of things like Bitcoin. Um, so if you can pick a place that has decided what the legal status is, it's a lot less risky. And there's also just durability and reliability. If you're spending a lot of money to have a service that needs to be up all the time, you probably don't want to host it in your basement. You want to find a physically secure facility for it. And there's a lot of things. And then there's, of course, choice of law. Like, gambling in the US is a super big problem to have any connection to, especially recently, purely for um, protection of the big existing casino industry. There's no moral, really, issues with it or anything, particularly. But uh, you can't have any of that stuff touch the US. So you have to pick a jurisdiction where you can. Um, so then there's this place called Sealand. Um, it's a World War II anti-aircraft anti fortress in the North Sea, uh, which if you just take that statement, uh, it's crazy. Um, so during World War II, the British had a problem with German bombers coming in and bombing London, so they decided they wanted to intercept them not over London, but over the North Sea. They started building these um, floating uh, platforms out in the North Sea, and, or not floating, but they're anchored platforms in the North Sea, and um, these uh, sort of got left behind at the end of the war, and they were sort of legal curiosities. Most of them got torn down, one of them didn't. The UK also did not have commercial radio, so uh, people were doing pirate, uh, pirate radio broadcasts from ships. Then they started cracking down on pirate radio broadcasts from ships, and so people started moving farther and farther out, and they eventually started looking at places like this. As far as I know, they never actually did pirate radio operations from this particular fort. They did it from other locations. But it was basically this place that was in, at the time, international waters, occupied by somebody who declared it sovereign. And that, if you look at international law, which is kind of crazy, is how you start a country. And so 
it's probably maybe sort of a country under the technical definition, although the population is very small, territory is very small, lots of other things. No one really cared about it because it was a relatively upstanding British family that had it. They didn't do anything bad with it. Uh, they didn't really cause too much trouble. The British are pretty accommodating of that kind of thing. And it was sort of this interesting legal curiosity, but that was about it. Um, and then, then we came around. Uh, there was this um, set of people, uh, who we'll name, uh, who had done business in various places, uh, Anguilla, various other places, and thought, oh, Sealand will be a great place to do a data haven, and went there. Um, so that's, that's our story. So the founders are Sean and Joe Hastings, uh, who have done crypto software for a long time, and me. We'd worked on crypto software actually in Anguilla uh, about a year apart, um, and worked from there for the ITAR reasons. Uh, Samir Parekh, who was the first SSL licensed vendor in the US in the 90s, and Avi Friedman, who was an early guy working on internet stuff, and then at Akamai and a bunch of other places, were very helpful early investors. And we had experience firsthand with Anguilla. This little tiny country, it's uh, maybe 7,000 people in the Caribbean, that didn't really have favorable laws in any way, it just didn't have a lot of laws, and we just moved there because it was sort of a nice place to live, sort of, if you like Caribbean islands, but there was no internet, um, shady legal system, all sorts of stuff like that. So, um, purely by accident, basically, we were all there at the same time. Um, so, one of the things that happened was, one, it was really boring. I don't really like little Caribbean islands. I'd be much happier in a place with lots of fast internet. Um, and it's one of those tourist places where you're only busy in the, like one month out of the year. Um, the law was unsettled in a lot of other places, so we couldn't really go there. Um, we looked at uh, some other countries we might be able to go to. Oh, we, we, so, we, oh so we left, we left Sealand, or we left um, Anguilla. Uh, we rented the house from a government official's brother at an above market rate, and then the other political party got elected in, and none of our work permits were valid anymore, so we basically got kicked off. It was exactly what you'd expect from a tiny country like that. Um, so we all left, and conveniently we're all in Oakland again, so uh, Oakland, California. So we were like hanging out, trying to figure out what to do next, and like, oh, we can't go to another little Caribbean island or something like that. We have to find some better solution to this thing, because we all wanted to build anonymous electronic cash, which is, I would say, probably the most difficult application to build. It meets all the requirements later in the talk. Um, so we were looking at either existing countries we could use, free trade zones we could possibly negotiate with certain countries, micro, and then this concept of microstates. So like uh, places like Sealand, there's a place in Australia, the Hutt River province, all sorts of like legal curiosities. Uh, we found this book called How to Start Your Own Country, which was a Loom Panics press, which is uh, sort of an alternative slash interesting stuff press, uh, and they published it, they mentioned Sealand, we contacted them and did that. But one of our other rejected ideas was to get a bunch of ships, accept toxic waste from a bunch of countries, put servers on the same barge as the toxic waste, such that they couldn't really do anything to the barge without causing like an environmental catastrophe. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of glad we didn't do that, actually. <laughs> um, so we found this place called Sealand and emailed the guy. It was a family that there were like two people living out on the place part time, and uh, they ran a fishing business in the in the uh, coast nearby. So it was it was basically disused. Um, it had a lot of stuff left over from World War II. Like they demilled it right after the war, so there are no like actual useful weapons or anything on it. But it had like tools and a bunch of stuff left over from then. And it was about 5,000, 10,000 square feet, um, falling apart, lots of, lots of issues. All the rooms looked sort of like this, if not worse. This was actually one of the cleanest rooms. Um, and they did have guns, but they were these like four inch deck guns or something that were um, like rusted solid and ended up getting cut and thrown over the overboard. Um, and this is sort of the layout of the thing. It was a structure, two cylindrical towers on top of a concrete barge. The whole thing's made out of ferrous cement and a superstructure. There were at one point 300 people living on this thing. The most we ever got on it was about 20, but um, usually around two. Um, and it was everything you would fear a 50 or 60 year old sort of abandoned sea structure would be like. Um, yeah, so they, they assembled it in place and they sunk it. It was, it was pretty crazy. Um, and it was decorated in high British fashion. Um, yeah. <laughs>
So yeah, and that's where it is. Uh, it's, so they changed the law on what um, international waters were. It used to be three nautical miles and you were international. They changed it to 12, but it was after the um, declaration of Sealand being an independent country. So it's probably okay, um, but it just adds lots of uncertainty. And if you see the town Felixstowe, we had a six story building there that we beamed our communications using a point to point Wi-Fi shot to. So it was a pretty close to shore, not that far, but the North Sea is not a fun place to, to be on a boat. Um, so there's sort of stages of the Sealand Haven Co adventure. All the Sealand stuff that happened before I got involved happened, but not a whole lot happened. There were some crazy legal things, but not very much physical infrastructure. Uh, so during the starting up phase, we did a lot of physical stuff, and then we set up a business structure in parallel. And I was like 19 years old at the time. This was also during the first dot com boom, so we didn't really have a lot of precedent to um, sort of copy things from. Like, it'd be really easy to do most of this stuff today, and technology was not quite where it should have been. But yeah, this is the structure as we went up to it. Uh, this, is this is actually an older photo, where it got, or a newer photo, where it sort of gotten cleaned up a little bit, but it was this basically bare structure. Um, yeah. Um, Getting out to it was on these little rigid, rigid inflatable rigid, um, rib boats, and you would lift the entire boat out of the water using a crane, uh, which was an exciting process. I learned to use Pelican dry cases, because if you don't, then your stuff gets wet, and it's really fun when you have a non-backed up Sony VAIO laptop to have to like disassemble it, run everything through deionized, deionized water or the closest thing you have, uh, and then like remove the electronics board from a hard drive because your only copies of keys were on that because somebody had taken your laptop out of the dry bag. But uh, yeah, so things like that. Um, this is what it looks like when you're getting carried up um, and it's really small from the air. Um, helicopter trips out to this thing because it's an offshore structure were like 3,000 pounds, so about $5,000 or so each trip because they have to be twin engine and everything else. So we would only really use a helicopter if the press were paying. If we were doing it, we used these little boats or we used a fishing boat. Um, this is sort of the process of getting winched up. In some cases, you wore a harness and it would get uh, attached to the back of your head and that. And later we added a 500 pound concrete ball as ballast, which made the whole process even more dangerous because if that thing hit you, oh, also the sea is pitching up and down like 15 feet. So um, there's a timing aspect to this. It's, it's yeah, crazy. Uh, um, so uh, the really interesting part is the data link. So this is the first thing we set up. This was a Tachyon 1.2 meter dish. Um, it's part of a VSAT network, which I later worked on that kind of stuff in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, you could get maybe two megs down, maybe a quarter meg uh, up, and it was a shared network across a lot of networks. The interesting thing about this is I'd never really set up a satellite network before, and uh, there's this whole polarization angle thing where you have horizontal and vertical polarization on signals. Uh, it turns out that the alternate polarization was actually the credit card processor for like all the gas stations in Europe. Uh, and I didn't have the thing turned correctly, so I blocked out satellite um, credit card processing for like 10 minutes when I first set this thing up, which was kind of a sh scary that you can do that with like one small satellite dish. But So that was our sort of a backup link because VSAT systems go to geostationary orbit and there's about 600 milliseconds, 1,000 uh, milliseconds of latency added, which is not so great for communications. Um, then at the very top of this, sorry, I didn't have any better photos. I didn't take as many photos back then as I would have, as I should have. Um, there was a microwave link. It was originally a Wi-Fi link. I think it was an 802.11b link with a PCMCIA card and a bunch of cables and a bunch of like completely hacked together junk going from this to the building on shore. We later replaced it with a $30,000 four by E1 system for no good reason that didn't work as well. So um, yeah, the Wi-Fi version worked better, way better. And then we had free BSD boxes sitting on shore that had um, E1 cards because I was really anti-Cisco at the time because I wanted open source routers. So I ran everything on Zebra and uh, free BSD boxes. And uh, the whole thing was like crazy because you could, like we didn't have enough redundancy in power cycling. So there were times where the power would go out in this building or something would crash and we'd have to like take a boat to go to the location. A bunch of times where I did like a make world uh, upgrade without, um, it working and the machine wouldn't come back up, stupid stuff like that that I would never do again. Um, but you can you can make this work with like really crazy stuff. Today you could do this with a cell, you're actually within range of a cell phone on shore, so you could just put a cell phone data card in your laptop and do largely the same thing. The way we set up our network was actually intentionally um, this way. We had a transport session that went between us and London Telehouse and another uh, peering facility so that we publicly peered with people in these high bandwidth locations. We did a lot of filtering and then brought it back to, the, to uh, Haven Co via links that we controlled that we could obfuscate because those links were much harder to replace, uh, something I talk about in a little bit. Um, 
Okay, so we did launch. Um, there was this Wired magazine has like a four month lead time on publications. So we were telling them what we were going to do in advance of actually doing it because it had to be ready. Uh, like the, the, we, we wanted it ready before the, the press hit. So there's a lot of speculative stuff. Um, probably the dumbest quote was the nitrogen filled data center quote where conceivably you could do that, but we had no money to do that kind of thing. Um, so we had a secret plan to all of this, which was to get a lot of press and using all that press in the peak of the market, be able to negotiate with another country to set up the second version of this, because our thinking was that doing the first one of these would be really hard to have any country say this would be a worthwhile thing to do, but getting another country to say, oh, we'll be the backup site for that would be really easy. So we'd get like a, a more real place, like say Hong Kong, to be our secondary data center. And then once you've got two, you can do like 10 of them really easily. So that was a reasonable plan, I think, um, but we didn't get to that point. We got about 300 major press articles. We had press flying out there all the time. It was the height of dot-com frenzy, but even at this point, it was team disorganization and stuff. Um, we had like a sales email box that we didn't answer. We just let it like accumulate because we were arguing over which ticketing system we should use. Uh, so we just didn't answer it, which was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and this is one of our launch photos. Uh, and this is me and this is Michael Bates, who was at the time the son of the Prince of Sealand, so he was like the second, I don't know what the royalty thing is, um, but yeah. This is yet more examples of lovely uh, British de decor for this place. Um, press, cool. So as you can expect, uh, given this a fail talk, there was a, uh, there's a crash. So there was the dot-com collapse, which I don't know how many people remember the details of it, but it was multiple things that happened in a row. Uh, it was sort of bad in 2000, and it got a lot bad in 2001, and it was bad for different sectors. There were all sorts of crazy things. The thing I really remember is Nortel stock, um, Apparently, if you had bought beer in Canada and saved the cans for the collection, like the deposit, you would have more money than if you had bought Nortel stock because it went to like almost nothing. Um, so we ran out of money. We thought we could raise more money. We didn't have any more money. Uh, we were burning uh, two big 55-gallon drums of diesel fuel every day. We had a lot of staff, all sorts of crazy stuff like that. Um, so we, did, we didn't have the ability to raise money from third parties. So we sort of refinanced and we originally had a contract where we could buy all of Sealand for about $5 million uh, in six to 12 months after launch, thinking, oh, it'll be really easy to raise whatever number of millions of dollars. And today or in 1989, that would be true, not true in 2000, 2001. So and instead, we ended up bringing the royal family of Sealand in as a partner. Um, they had run this place since like 1966. It was their main asset, their main pride and joy. They thought about it a lot. So they thought about this entirely differently than we did. Uh, we were willing to push the limits on one data center in order to um, expand the model, do things like that. They were much more conservative, um, which I can't really fault them for. Uh, and then we ran on a shoebox budget. Uh, my friend Avi, one of our investors, so he put in, I think, like a million dollars or so originally, and then every time I'd fly to Boston, he'd give me a bunch of cash, like a bunch of cash, like 10 grand or something, and I would use that to pay bills, and we didn't really keep track of it. It was like the, the ultimate thing you don't do in, with investments of like throwing good money after bad. Uh, he just kept it running, which was awesome of him, but uh, yeah, not a good financial decision. Um, then, so we we basically run out of money. We, at peak, we we're spending like 30, 50K a week or so on renovations, and then we got down to the point where we had to pay for things from our server hosting, and we had maybe like a grand left over every month. We had this food, which was mostly left over from pre-Haven Co days, and this was, yeah, yeah, it was, it was exciting. Um, of those things, there's some corned beef from Argentina that is actually the most wretched thing I have eaten, um, and we ate like most of this stuff. Um, Meh, place. Um, so as far as servers go, um, these are a bunch of Celeron 533 boxes. Uh, we had this, I think, fairly justifiable fear that if people saw how little infrastructure we had, nobody would actually buy anything. Um, this was our showcase data room of what the rest of the rooms would look like. Um, this was, in fact, the only one. So uh, yeah, uh, it got a little bit more populated, but this is about like two thirds of the peak. Um, very small number of servers, some UPSs. We got a bigger UPS later, but all basically FreeBSD and Linux stuff. Um, pretty reasonable, but yeah, very, very small scale. Uh, and we never had more than eight megs of bandwidth going to the place. Uh, we had aggressive caching, and then much more aggressive caching after I left, which is an interesting story. Uh, this is about peak capacity. Um, so yeah, sitting in a knock. The, the rooms are 20, or um, 
they're like six meter cylinders, so you've got a circular set of desks around them in this room, and that was where I spent most of my time, mostly on IRC, which is the main thing you do when you're on a little island like that. Um, yeah, so speaking of aggressive caching, so we had this whole model where we would host things, uh, where rather we would host things on Sealand, and then we would have peering sessions and um, transit purchased in places like London Telehouse and in a place in New York, and then we bring the transport back. Those edge boxes are really tempting to use for caching. Um, after I left, which wasn't on the most friendly of circumstances in the end of 2002, I think they decided it would be a lot cheaper to just not have anything on Sealand anymore and put everything in those locations and not tell anyone. Uh, it was really obvious for two reasons. One, the ping times were zero milliseconds from the edge to this. Normally it's about two milliseconds by speed of light. And then there was a huge fire because the original structure was all like ferro cement and everything else. The new generator room, which they stored a bunch of oily rags in, um, was made of tar paper. And the predictable thing happened after like five years. I don't know why it took five years, but it eventually completely caught on fire. It was a huge fire and nothing happened on the servers. So uh, yeah, um, there's that. So <laughs> given many, I would say the failure here was overdetermined. So we have lots of reasons why it failed and we need to sort of like piece apart why those things are. Some of them are totally idiosyncratic to a tiny platform in the North Sea. Those are less interesting unless you, for some reason, want to build something on a tiny platform in the North Sea. There's other things that are much more general as data haven issues. Um, the core reasons were economics. The product itself wasn't all that great. And to be honest, we were not the greatest team. Um, none of us had any experience running large businesses or even small businesses or really anything. Um, and then we did have the market, like it's really lame to blame the market for it, but I think the 2000 to 2001 collapse in bandwidth prices was a fundamental um, driver. So what happened is we had an inherently high cost, which was totally fine in 2000. Um, there were two reasons for high cost. It was high cost because it was on this little tiny platform. It was also high cost because we didn't have any scale. When you're buying eight megabits of internet and transporting it over E1s, you pay a pretty high cost per megabit. If you're buying 155, which is what we'd originally ordered, um, the cost per megabit is a lot lower. Um, and then we had the issue that in 1999, 2000, the price for, I guess, Akamai um, service was like two to $3,000 a megabit per second effectively. Transit was one to 2K or something a megabit. Um, then the market collapsed and people would start selling below their own cost because they had to. Uh, sometimes they'd sell below their marginal cost, which is crazy, but usually bandwidth doesn't have a marginal cost. Um, so basically like the market price went to like $10 and our cost was 500 and we built everything on like 3000. So that was a serious problem. And then there was another more ser additionally serious problem is we were missing some key components to make this a great product. And then we didn't have any money to do anything differently. Um, because we only had only, only eight megs, we had to really ration bandwidth. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do that you'd wanna have more bandwidth for. Um, this was also pre-virtualization, so you had to have physical servers and one server per customer was like a crazy thing. Um, the biggest problem I would say is we had no way for our customers to handle payments. If you were a purely cipher space business, you still had to go incorporate somewhere to get a bank account to accept credit card processing. There was no Bitcoin back then. And I proposed at the beginning of this thing that we fund building anonymous electronic cash as the first enabler for this thing, because if you have anonymous electronic cash and a secure place to put your server, you don't actually need to incorporate anywhere. You can just have a key as your, your thing. Um, but we didn't do that. Um, and then we never really found a single really solid application for this thing. So all the things from doing startups that I know you shouldn't do, we did. Um, and then the team and structure issue. Uh, fundamentally, the issue was that um, the Sealand people were more traditional, much, much more legally averse to risk, uncertainty, things like that. And then there was me. Uh, and I was very willing to push the limits on stuff because you know, like, I just walk away from it if it failed. So like I was trying to get to success. There's a whole model in like venture capital where it's okay to fail like 100 times if your one success is like a 10,000 time uh, bigger return. Um, so we were pushing for that kind of thing and that isn't the kind of thing you do if it's your, your house basically. Um, then we had lots of internal team issues, politics like that. And also it's just boring. Like this place was like five or 10,000 square feet. It was kind of cool when I got to like leave every week or two, but there was a period where I was out there for six months because I didn't have any money to go anywhere else. So I was basically living on a tiny little one, uh, tiny little platform. There was one other person there who was like a security guard, like a 60 year old British guy security guard. And I arranged to have like an offset by 12 hour shift from him. So I would not actually see another person for like three months at a time. It was, it was uh, probably not the most uh, psychologically awesome thing to do. But I had IRC, so that totally made it better. Uh, yeah.
So there's things that you would expect from building a data haven that would be the reasons for failure, and they actually, in our case, were not reasons for failure. We don't know that these things are not reasons for failure in general, but they were not our reasons for failure. Maybe we didn't get to them, maybe we were lucky. So legal or regulatory pressure never actually was an issue at all. Um, we got some very, very cursory legal threats type things, but they were mostly from civil things. Uh, we didn't host anything really bad. We had a very correctly chosen for the risk model we had, acceptable use policy. So no spam, no child porn, no hacking other people's servers, and uh, I think we added no terrorism on 9-11. There wasn't really a thought before that. Um, and those, that was like the entirety of our acceptable use policy. We were sort of in the gray area about copyright. We also had the benefit that our cost was so high for servers that you would not be able to put a file sharing server on it and have it be profitable. If we'd had much lower costs, that would have become an issue. Um, there was no real competition for a physical data haven at the time. There were secure facilities, but there was no data haven as such. Um, and no one had a great software replacement for this kind of thing. Um, no one hacked us, as far as I know. Uh, we had very little infrastructure ourselves, so it's unlikely that that got hacked. Some of our customers might have gotten hacked, but we wouldn't know. But there was no like major hacking incident or anything. And there were no fundamental technical issues here. Um, getting bandwidth out to this place would not have been that hard with like five or $10 million versus $2 million. Um, lots of things like that. So these weren't really reasons for failure, but we don't know if there's, these are the things that I'm much more concerned about. Are, is there an actual demand for data center, or data haven type services? I think there is, but we don't really know for sure. How can you make a viable product that people will actually be able to pay for? Like there's plenty of people who would love to have a server that could never be shut off, but are they people who will be able to pay for that service at the cost required? And then the biggest problem with this whole thing is it's really easy to have like one or two uh, like float below the, the, the radar. Um, if you've got some services that don't attract any negative attention, you're fine until you have like uh, lava bit or something hosted on you and then legal stuff happens. So basically the more successful you get, the higher the odds of some horrible incident happening and then having to resist it, which is sort of the opposite of a lot of other models where the bigger you get, the easier it is to be successful. So that's a, that's a fundamental thing. And then there's a question of can you do this better in software? If you can ever do something in software rather than spending money on platforms and offshore data havens, it's totally worth it. And then the other question is even if you can do all this stuff, should we do it? Like, not everything you can do should be done by people. Um, I think free speech trumps uh, the other um, disincentives to doing this thing, so I think data havens should exist, but it is an open question and people have different opinions on that. Um, so we're not the only data haven, there have been data havens since then, and based on the earlier definition, um, there's different ones. So I would say that a conventional uh, great data center, like a tier one or whatever facility, is um, a data haven in terms of keeping your servers available. You're subject to the laws in whatever country you are, and the nice thing is like the US has great laws for certain things, Ireland, Germany have great laws for other things, and you can pick and choose your application. Uh, there's the company called The Bunker, and there's a couple other things where they've taken World War, uh, uh, Cold War bunkers and refitted them as data centers. They're in the countries that have uh, certain laws, so in, they'll have either UK law or uh, Swedish law or Swiss law or other things like that, but um, they're nice facilities. They generally have weaker network connectivity than the center of town data centers like Telehouse would, so there's a trade-off there. Uh, there's a bulletproof hosting model, so there's this whole world, oh, the other rule we had was no spam. Um, speaking of bulletproof hosting, um, the response URLs that people go to from spam get shut down by people all the time, malware URLs get shut down all the time, and there's this concept of a bulletproof host that will stay up against this kind of attack. Usually the term bulletproof host is used specifically around this kind of like nuisance type stuff versus free speech, but you could use it in any way. And there's a famous company in the Netherlands that was raided and has some crazy stuff. And then there's distributed software systems, and then there's application specific systems that are designed around redundancy. Um, so yeah, um, this is a $2 billion data center in uh, downtown San Francisco, which is later got sold for like $25 million or something, where the generators all went out. Um, this is an awesome facility, uh, Pionin um, Bonhoff Data Center, which I've never been to, but I'd love to get a server there someday. Um, Telehouse, the, probably the premier internet interconnection center in all of Europe, uh, which is also a great, I used to live like five blocks away from that place, which I thought would be awesome, but it's actually more of a pain to move a server five blocks than it is to move it like across town, because you feel bad about taking a taxi that distance and you can't really carry it, so that was not a good decision. And this is the bunker, or the, the cyber bunker, sorry, the cyber bunker. Um, so there have been successes. So Havenco, not a complete failure. We did accomplish the goal of like making things popularized and things like that, but it was not a commercial success in any way. I lost like a quarter of a million dollars by spending a bunch of money 
not getting reimbursed on credit cards, which is not awesome. Um, but there have been people who have been successful. Uh, Bitcoin, as far as we can tell so far, like it's not the finished book, but like it's been pretty successful. Pirate Bay has been successful, sort of, like they've moved their servers around and have been relatively successful. BitTorrent has been incredibly successful at keeping um, things available, but has not been commercially terribly successful. WikiLeaks has remained online despite doing stuff that the most powerful governments in the world uh, don't like. And the really exciting thing they did was this insurance file concept. Um, Silk Road was, I guess there's an asterisk, so was basically successful technically, except for some user admin issues or something. And Tor has been pretty successful, in especially hidden services, which are relevant in this case. Um, so really, if we, so we don't want to just like blindly do the same thing again. We want to do, figure out what went wrong and fix it. Um, so how not to fail. You want to think about your application model for the technical side of it. You want to think about who your threats are and um, the, the adversaries. You definitely need to think about law, business model, and useful technologies that can, that can help you. Um, so as far as application, you want to do as little hard stuff as possible ever. You always want to do easy stuff, and you want to make sure it's like the, I guess I could use a Sun Tzu quote or something, but you always want to meet the enemy on a ground where you control, where it's your advantage. You don't want to fight in your weak spot. So do things that are easy. Like static data is pretty easy to keep resistant from censorship. You just make lots of copies. It's also resistant against um, accidental deletion, whatever. So if you have a lot of copies, the cool thing with the insurance file is, in, is distributing widely an encrypted file and then distributing the small key later. Um, because basically they won't censor it because they can't go back in time. So it's kind of awesome. Um, you end up with a lot of general distributed systems problems. Um, do you need to have immediate consistency, some sort of global lock? Can you do eventual consistency? All these things that like computer scientists deal with and then web application developers and application developers deal with are super relevant in the data haven world. Um, and then there's uh, the hardest thing possible is to build a um, legacy. So you can't build a custom client. You have to use like a regular web browser, globally synchronized transaction system. That is the hardest thing to build. So if you can build a data haven that will work with that model, you have won, uh, maybe. Um, Threats and adversaries, depending on who your threats are, there's a lot of techniques you can do and they're different against different people. If you're worried about um, a government in the Middle East, if government in Africa, something else, going after your community, uh, your global diaspora community for human rights stuff, put your servers in a place like Germany or in the United States because those governments will be happy to stand up to a dictator, at least as far as not giving them the copies of your data. Um, you can split apps across jurisdiction. I've seen, so I did the work in Iraq and Afghanistan just doing like satellite internet for people, but I got to meet some of the law enforcement people and see the trouble they go through when they're trying to deal with servers that are in multiple jurisdictions. In a lot of cases, they don't even bother if it's in a particularly difficult jurisdiction, like say Eastern Europe. Um, but if you can make that so it's like the Russian dolls problem of multiple servers, they get bored pretty fast. Um, and you can use disposable front ends, which has been sort of the WikiLeaks model, where the pieces that you have the most of and that you can easily replace, um, you make those pop up, those are the only things that are exposed, and then you have servers in the back end, your big data repository processing, that's much harder to replace, you keep shielded. And then you minimize the bulletproof computing base, that's so sort of the inverse of a trusted computing base or sort of related to trusted computing base, where the parts that actually need to be re resilient against all these attacks should be as small as possible for your application. Um, laws and politics, these always change. I know much more about technology than I do about laws, but the, the issue we had in the 90s was that law wasn't really settled. We had both, I mean, there's a concept, at least in, in um, common law countries of like black letter law and then uh, court law or case law. Uh, there were lots of cases where there was neither black letter law nor case law. Now at least there's case law. In a lot of cases, there's black letter law about it. Um, but there wasn't a lot of that stuff back in the, in the day. Um, then while Sealand was still going on during terrorism, I woke, I, I was uh, like asleep, I'd gotten in like a weird sleep schedule, so I woke up at local 3 p.m. or so, which was like an hour after the 9-11 uh, World Trade Center attacks. Woke up, saw the TV of like these things crashing in and thought, uh, one, that sucks, and two, whoa, they're going to completely ruin like any possibility of doing offshore data haven stuff. So I set up an anonymous remailer later that day and a bunch of other stuff that like pushed the limits a little bit more, but it was pretty clear that terrorism was gonna get used to beat down any form of anonymity, even for things that are totally unrelated to uh, terrorism. In the 90s, we had the four horsemen of uh, child porn, money laundering, terrorism, and tax evasion, and it's a lot easier to scare people with terrorism than it is to scare people with like, ooh, evil tax evaders or something. So, um, so we were afraid of that. 
The other thing is you wanna have a preemptive positive legal campaign. If you are behind the curve and the first thing anyone hears about you is something negative like you're used for child porn, you have lost. No matter if the law's on your side, they'll just change the law or they'll change the interpretation or your funding will get pulled or something like that. You wanna make sure that you've got good stories out there of like how you're helping um, people escape horrible situations, um, things like that first. Uh, and then you pick some cases that have really good, good optics. So you help open source projects, you help uh, like the overseas diaspora of a country where the country is monitoring those people's communications, thing like that. The other key thing, which I think is, these are, they're, these are all fairly obvious. The one that I thought was the most um, useful is pick one um, known main adversary, one threat, and make sure you can defeat that. So in our case, we could pick something like gambling and we could be the, the awesome place where you can host your gambling servers. No one really cared about gambling except for the US government and they were 5,000 miles away from us so we didn't really have to worry about them very much. We would not have picked something that a lot of countries hated or that the British specifically hated because they're much closer to us. So pick one thing to do and just do that thing rather than like and taking on every, every other country in the world. Um, then there's an open question about business model. You really wanna have a working business model before you scale up your business, so keep your costs low in building something like this so you can pick a model. Uh, a lot of the problems are the interesting customers are usually not really able to pay very much. The boring customers are slow to move. So you can get interesting customers with not a lot of money early on, but you can't really serve them unless you either have a lot of money or have very low costs, and there's that. The non-intuitive thing is to build a system that works really, really, really well for one specific application. So you could build like anonymous remailers or one of the most secure, most um, effective against very high level threats systems out there because they only dealt with email. Whereas Tor has a much harder problem because it deals with arbitrary protocols or in other, in the arbitrary data haven has more things. So if you can build a single application that you know a lot about, it's pretty easy. Or it relatively, it, it's much easier, not pretty easy. Um, and then solve something that's on the efficient frontier of risk and value. Don't put like hundreds of millions of dollars into solving something where you're only like a tiny bit better than somebody else. Uh, either don't spend a lot of money to be tiny bit, bit better or um, spend a lot of money but be amazingly awesome at it. And then cross subsidize. If you build a system for your own application, you might make really high margins on say offering email addresses and, and stuff where the hosting can be higher than it is at other places because you have less cost for other things. And then hybrid solutions where you have like a P2P model, a software system and a data haven that are working together or things like that. There's, or an open source thing or you have something like Catfax where it's not an objectionable application. You use that to demonstrate your technology and then build something else later. Um, so there's a lot of useful technologies that didn't really exist in the late 90s when we were doing this stuff that do exist now. Um, Tor, one of the more useful tools here. We have a lot of people talk about Tor, there's no point in me talking about Tor. Um, Heavyweight clients, there was a period in the early 2000s where it was basically just web clients, no one wanted to w run um, local software on their machine and it was sort of before JavaScript was at the level where you could run a real client there. Um, two things have killed that model, one, Ajax JavaScript stuff, so you can build a pretty heavyweight client in a web browser, even it doesn't require network access. Even better, you have mobile phones and things where you can have an actual application. Uh, so we've gotten back to the point where you can build an application that has local state, which lets you do much more interesting protocols, and you can build new protocols. There, you can build a protocol that's much more resistant to censorship than HTTP to a static address. Um, and I'm a big fan of message-based systems rather than connection-oriented systems. If your fundamental task is message-based, you can pass these messages around, like in the UUCP model or the anonymous remailer model, rather than opening a pipe. It's much more anonymous, much more secure, much more reliable uh, than that, and use latency in that kind of situation to your advantage. Uh, th however, there's a bunch of missing technologies. We still have not, I would say, solved the anonymous electronic cash problem. I mean, Bitcoin is a decent system, but is not anonymous. Uh, certainly not anonymous against determined effort to find arbitrary transactions, not anonymous by default. So zero coin and some systems like that might be sufficient. I am still a true believer in Chaumian electronic digital blinded cash. Um, it has a long and kind of sad history, but I think someone will eventually do this and it'll be successful. Um, I think we also need to reboot the anonymous remailer network. I mean, one of the sad things was Len Sassaman was the main uh, remailer guy and he's no longer with us, so we don't have a remailer network that is as good as it was in like 2003, so we need to at least get back to that level and maybe build something better. And then cloud computing. You, if you're building all this stuff for Data Haven and then you've got uh, AWS as your backend for your application, 
it's really easy to send a subpoena to there or do whatever else. Uh, having a trustworthy cloud where the operator can't modify your computing would be great. And it's not really cost effective to have de dedicated physical servers for each machine, especially in an offshore data haven. So there's that. And then secure client devices. As we've seen with the Silk Road example, um, no matter how great your server security is, uh, if your client device is captured, unencrypted, or whatever else, you've got serious problems. Uh, so yeah, that's basically, um, these, I have a bunch of URLs. This will be up on the web somewhere. Um, a lot of stuff. There's a bunch of articles. Um, some interesting legal analysis of this that has been, has been done by people and that. So yeah, data havens have existed in concept and practice for, I, would, I think there's probably examples from the 50s and 60s, but certainly from the 70s and 80s, and genuinely mixed results. So there's lots of work to do in the future. Uh, I'd be very interested in any questions or comments or anyone has. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, please use that. Thank you very much. So, any questions, anyone? Okay. A uh, question from the internet. In his opinion, does, A bit louder, the, please. does the unwanted attention, drugs, politics, and poorly supervised business and data redundancy models like Cyberbunker outweigh the benefits of a data haven? Please repeat. <laughs> In your opinion, does the unwanted attention drugs and politics, and poorly supervised business and data redundancy models like Cyberbunker outweigh the benefits of a data haven? Yeah, I, I think the, the need for a data haven in 1998 was very, very clear because the laws would not allow lots of very legitimate applications. In, 2000, in September 10th, 2000, I would probably maybe have answered the other way that laws in the US and in Europe were pretty good at the time. Um, however, Patriot Act, uh, RIP in the UK, lots of things have been pushing in the other direction. So while there are severe negatives to spam, abusive use, things like that, uh, I think actual legitimate free speech use is, an, is sufficiently at risk that the value of data havens is, if not absolute today, a yes, uh, there's a very easy projection where it is. So I think we need the technology, even if we use it for the equivalent of better latency reduction, having servers close to people, uh, we should build that and then, yeah. So. Um, please, if you leave the room now, please leave silent. Thank you very much. And take your garbage with you. Thanks, please. On a scale from one to 10, how much bullshit would you say is in the you know, ecosystem around the you know, Bitcoin and, coin, uh, and, block, and blockchain uh, uh, technology right now and also in the startup world in general? Okay. Yes, uh, that is a good question. Um, when 10 being the most? Okay, so I think there is clearly value in both a lot of the startups and in Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is an awesome solution to uh, distributed systems uh, problem that has been open for a long time. Bitcoin itself as, as a currency does not really personally excite me. I own 2.3 Bitcoin after winning a bet about the North Korea hackers in Sony thing. So um, I'm not, I mean, it's a, it, I think it is not the, the final system. I don't think Bitcoin as it is today is gonna be the system that does everything we want it to do. But I think some anonymous electronic payment system or some form of value will and that might be blockchain, it might be Bitcoin over time, it might change. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of hype with startups, but especially in Silicon Valley where uh, it seems like everyone like does it by default, but there's also a lot of value. Um, the, the contrary to that is look, look at the big companies and how much innovation they have. It seems like they have outsourced all of the innovation to startups that they then buy. So maybe it's a fundamental shift in how business works, but yeah, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of good and a lot of bad and we don't really know. So five, five. Um, I think maybe, maybe like there's another axis, like an I axis or something here, but yeah. Have you considered the benefits of distributing a decentralized uh, config setup just like the Pirate Bay did uh, while the servers were like taken down from everywhere they popped up? Um, because I think that superior states like the United States, they would just like bomb Zealand if it, it was just a great threat to their yep. geopolitical agenda if it didn't have public support and uh, military to back it up. Yeah, ab absolutely. The, 
level of protection you can get from a physical location is up to how angry you make people that have the ability to bomb you. Um, hosting gambling servers never would have gotten to that point. Our most objective, the weirdest thing that I learned was that there's a lot of stuff that's legal in like set of country A, and then a lot of stuff that's legal in set of country B, but then there's like the combination of that. I guess I can talk about them now, but like we had a customer that did this weird bidding or betting on porn images. So porn in countries that are okay with gambling is usually bad. So there were very few countries that had both porn and gambling being okay. You'd bet on like which of six softcore images would be popular, the most popular among the people that week. And you would uh, then win if it was the most popular thing, which is actually pretty awesome. I think it would be a fun thing to recreate. But um, they couldn't find an, an acceptable gaming jurisdiction and an acceptable porn jurisdiction that was all in one. But no one's going to bomb us for that. So yeah. Um, yeah, I agree that the people, like WikiLeaks, I, I am certain that if the US government could quietly kill the people involved in WikiLeaks and not get caught for it or not be attributable, it would have happened. So the only thing that kept the people alive and successful was being distributed in that sort of system. That is the most system, resistant system against a large threat like that, or finding a counterweight nation state or something like going to Russia is the solution. They're not gonna like go to war with Russia over Snowden, but they would have potentially done more pressure against smaller countries. So there's a crazy geopolitical thing involved. But yeah, software, crypto, the nice thing, the thing that got me interested in crypto when I was like 11 or 12 years old was knowing that I was like in a house, in a suburban house and I had like very little resources. I could do something that no one could undo like cryptographically. The, the computing power on my machine was enough that with the right algorithm you couldn't decrypt it um, even if you had all the resources of everyone that would ever exist in any part of the universe. So that is a really awesome concept. And if you can use that to your advantage, yeah, go for it. But there's a lot of things you can't do that, like transaction systems make it much harder to do. Um, it seems like in a way, Toyd and Services has achieved some of what you intended to, to achieve with Haven Co. Um, do you see any other practical alternatives to Toyd and Services right now or things coming up that might be better than Toyd and Services? Yeah, Tor Hidden Services is a great system within the security parameters of the Tor network. I think if you had a sufficiently dangerous application hosted on a Tor hidden service, or if you made a mistake, you could compromise the entire Tor system. Tor is not designed to resist a really determined active global adversary, and that is the adversary that we face. Um, they're willing to modify packets, they're willing to do whatever. So I don't think you could run a long running Tor hidden service with a Tor network as it is today with uh, something that the US government really, really, really cared about defeating to the point where they would break arbitrary laws for. Um, like if the location of Osama bin Laden had been discoverable by dis defeating all of Tor in like 2005 or so, it would have been defeated. Um, so that's a partially a problem of the system, it's partially a problem of scale. But um, I think there are systems that you could build with feasible resources that would resist that threat. I think the systems that would be the easiest to build and the most feasible are message-based systems like Anonymous Remailer. Uh, Tim May had this awesome thing, um, Blacknet, back in like the mid 90s, where you would send anonymous mail to anonymous remailer. It would then wait like a week or so and do some operation on it and email you back a response or send it to a Usenet posting group. That's much more secure against a global passive or global, a global active adversary than a connection oriented system. With connection oriented systems, you can just do crazy stuff like if you think someone is the, the per, if you can list it like 10,000 people that are possible candidates, you look at their travel patterns, you arrest like 10 of them if, you, if they're high probability, you see if a service goes offline, you go after servers individually. There's lots of stuff you can do if you're willing to be a bad person to uncover Tor hidden services. But it's an awesome system and it's like the, it's the best practical thing we have today. Um. Yes, please, from the internet. Yes, there's a question. Uh, could an established multinational company theoretically build a data haven within itself currently? Yes, um, so, and multinational organizations often do have things that are very close to data havens. Like I think, I've, I've done a lot of computer security stuff over the past two decades. There's a crazy fact of like, if you're a regulated industry that has to meet a certain security objective, like a government contractor, a government entity, um, somebody who has some external regulation, you will meet that regulation, but you won't go any beyond that regulation. The people who have like an open-ended liability if their things are compromised, do actually in some cases an exceptionally good job of security. Pharma companies doing drug discovery work where the molecule is like the most secret thing in the world for them, they have actually good security. Um, Proprietary trading firms, they keep their algorithms relatively secure uh, against like 
compared to what I would say any government agency has done. So there are organizations that do a pretty good job of this. Usually those are, those are usually static data ho hosting systems, not transaction processing systems, and they're for internal use. It's a much easier model because you don't really have to worry about censorship or denial of service attack or other action. You just need to keep integrity and operation. But yeah, uh, corporations internally can build very secure systems. However, most corporations, as everyone is aware, have pretty horrible internal systems. Okay. One question here. Is there any system you would recommend to watch out for in the future? Uh, Zuko is working on zero coin, zero cash. Uh, well, I think that's public, I hope. Um, that's the thing that I'm personally the most excited about. Uh, there's, yeah, I think that's the most exciting system. Uh, Tor, ITP will continue development. I think they have to, they're on a curve that is not gonna get to where you really need to be for Data Haven unless they um, dramatically change or improve, I think it, there needs to be some improvement and change. Part of that is coming up with legitimate applications. So if, if um, horrible governments get elected, US, Europe, everywhere else, such that the need for data havens is increased and more people see it as a mainstream thing that we have to have, we'll get great data havens. However, we'll live in a world that has really shitty US and European governments where people get like abducted and killed and all sorts of stuff like that. It's not really a trade-off I'd want. So what we really want is a data haven that's really secure in an environment where uh, you don't really need them. And that's sort of a fundamental quandary of if you don't need it, well, no one's gonna spend the money doing it. You're the best people in the world aren't gonna work on it. They're gonna work on something like delivering uh, faster traffic rather than more secure traffic. So. Okay, one last question from the internet. Uh, is there a data haven do-it-yourself how-to online? If not, would you like to put on online? And is there a data haven uh, software as a service? Yes. Um, there is not a good document for this. I'm working on, I'm, I bought a couple cabinets of space and I'm building out what I think the best way to build um, hosting and uh, just sort of like best practice for that will be. I'll document all that and put it up. but. Until we get a virtualization platform that can do remote attestation. So, I had this company before I joined um, Cloudflare CryptoSeal that was doing um, cloud computing where you could remotely attest to the integrity of a container and the VM and everything else. There was no market for it, it was very hard to build. Um, Private Core, which got bought by Facebook, was working on very similar stuff. Um, until we have better hardware platforms, Intel SGX is a start, but a lot of other stuff. Uh, we aren't gonna be able to build a virtual, virtualized platform that is secure enough for this kind of stuff. And without that, it's gonna be very hard to make this commercially viable. Uh, if you have to use dedicated hardware for every single customer, it'll be pretty challenging. So, yeah, um, maybe. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Okay, for all the others, Sulis, please take your garbage with you, and we will continue in 15 minutes, memory corruption, why can't we have nice things? Thank you. <laughs>